Eugene woke up once again from his bed, having spent a wonderful night. We had a lovely night, didn't we? Yeah, we did. They had officially established their romantic relationship. Eugene was no longer the somewhat timid and irritable man he used to be. Now, he exuded mature charm. It seemed that good things come to those who wait, and everything was falling into place. Maxine shared similar interests and personality traits with Eugene, making them a perfect match. After spending some intimate time together, Maxine got up. It was time for her to go to work. However, she had an additional task for the day, helping Eugene steal confidential files from the Milton family. Half an hour later, Maxine sat in her office, lost in thought. Although she had decided to assist Eugene, she couldn't shake off a sense of guilt. Pamela, rehearsing her speech, noticed Maxine's unusual demeanor. Max? You okay? You seem... Maxine hastily assured her that everything was fine, and Pamela, not prying further, returned to her office. Later, Maxine remembered something she had forgotten and caught up with Pamela. The accountant had sent the budget for the upcoming Founders Day event, with a surplus of $50,000. How about starting a scholarship fund? Before Maxine could finish, Pamela's expression became a little more serious. She didn't care about poor families, Pamela only cared about power and face. All she had to do was to make the event a success and make her speech and the people would respect her. You really should get going. You've got that five o'clock dinner. Yes. Thank you. But Pamela doesn't say what she really thinks and politely declines Maxine's offer. Maxine realized that Pamela, the supposed benevolent leader of the Commonwealth, was nothing more than a hypocritical power-hungry politician. After Pamela left, Maxine quickly searched through the filing cabinets, nervously glancing at the door to see if anyone was approaching. Soon, she found a report on missing persons, detailing their specific information. Hey! <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm, I didn't mean to scare you. No, Sebastian, hi. Uh, no, you didn't. Is there something that I can help you? Yes, uh, is, is... <laughs> Sebastian arrived, seemingly to check if Pamela was still upset. Maxine tried to be natural and said, Your mom's gone to a meeting. I can tell her you were here. Sebastian, appearing somewhat intoxicated, began speaking incoherently. Oh god, I mean, you even take it home with oh, you? Oh, no, that's a, I, no, I, I got I, it. I it's okay. Fine. That's fine. <laughs> Seeing Maxine so nervous about the file, Sebastian felt something was wrong. They just stared at each other awkwardly. But as it was his mom's secretary, Sebastian didn't dare to do anything. So he just thought it was a secret document. Maxine also breathed a sigh of relief. It was a very unpleasant feeling. At night she took the file to Eugene's room. Connie and the others are here to look through the file. But unfortunately it only contains information about the missing persons, followed by a series of numbers not knowing if they're coordinates or something else. However, the information proved insufficient to expose the Milton family. Connie says they're going to continue to gather evidence, but she can expose Sebastian for sending people out to steal money and let the masses criticize the bastard. As they discuss their plan, there was a knock on the door. Anxious, they quickly organized the documents, but Magna reassured them that the visitor was Ezekiel. Having successfully recovered from cancer surgery, Ezekiel, with a significant base among the lower classes, could help escalate the situation. And I got a whole network, ready and willing to ride at dawn. With this, they gained even more confidence. The forthcoming actions meant there was no turning back. This was their first battle launched against the corrupt government. Despite the risks, it held significant meaning. They were about to embark on a historic revolution. The next day, Maxine returned to the office early, replacing the stolen files to avoid suspicion. Another half hour passed and Maxine was ready to face the storm. At that moment Pamela came in with an indignant look on her face and threw a newspaper on Maxine's desk. It said, Pamela is lying to you, and it told of her son threatening civilians to steal money. In the afternoon, a large crowd gathered outside the administrative building, holding portraits of the missing persons and protesting. We want justice! And this woman Pamela panicked. On the broadcast, she addressed the citizens of the Commonwealth, claiming the reports were lies spread by malicious individuals to sow fear and anger. I understand my son. He is an upright young man and couldn't possibly do such a thing. But the people aren't stupid. Everyone knows what Sebastian is like. They just don't dare to speak out. And Sebastian has long since disappeared. Connie and the others found solace in the fact that the first step of their revolution seemed to be highly successful. Michael, accompanied by soldiers, 
arrived at the square. Instead of stopping the protesters, he instructed his subordinates to avoid any stampede incidents. What are you doing out of uniform? Personal day. Not today. Not with all this. This isn't my problem, it's not yours either. Michael was about to say something when a report came over the intercom from one of his men that there was a situation at the checkpoint that required him to go there. Following this, Michael entered the interrogation room at the checkpoint. Seated before him was a handsome man. Unmistakably Negan, this guy exuded confidence. Michael began questioning Negan about his motives. Wondering why he insisted on meeting him, Negan replied, I used to have a friend who mentioned you. Her name was Elspeth. She said if I ever wanted to meet her, I should find you. Michael didn't remember Elspeth, but he sensed that Negan had something important to communicate that just wasn't convenient here. Get him some water. No. After the soldier left the room, Michael questioned Negan again, asking who sent him. Negan replied, Daryl told me to trust only you. We're being hunted by a guy named Lance, who has been attacking us. But the problem is that we have fellow family members here at the Commonwealth, and I need to get in there and make sure they're safe. Just let you in. We got rules here. Oh, rules. Right. Well, if no one else is playing by those rules, then why are you? People in the Commonwealth have been marching in the streets demanding that Pamela hand over her evil son and give the victim's family a fair accounting. The sound of protests echoed throughout the entire city. At this moment, in a certain building where Daryl and Aaron were both absent, their children were under the care of Carol, unavailable to join the protests outside. Carol, curious, glanced towards the commotion. To her surprise, she spotted two individuals driving against the flow of traffic, seemingly heading towards their building. Carol, having experienced the apocalypse, had developed a cautious nature. Without delay, she instructed the children to gather their belongings and hide. Five minutes later, a knock on the door echoed. As there was no response, the door was forcefully opened. Indeed, they were here. Upon entering, the intruders began searching every room. This is Daryl's residence. So by the looks of this they should be looking for Judith and RJ. Just not sure what they're up to. Carol, concealed outside, prepared to take action if she were discovered. Fortunately, the woman did not notice. Meanwhile, the three children hid under the kitchen cabinets. Failing to find anyone, the intruders prepared to leave for the school. Downstairs, Negan, observing the lively square, couldn't believe such a place existed in the post-apocalyptic world. Well, what are you doing here, man? Negan then remembered that he had business to attend to. Well, I'm here to save your asses. Where is Carol? At this moment, Carol was packing to relocate when she heard footsteps in the staircase. She promptly had the children hide. Approaching the door, Carol heard Jerry's voice. Unexpectedly, she opened the door to find Negan. Following that, Negan recounted the events of Lance pursuing them. Now Carol realized that those men were supposed to have come to take the children to force Daryl and the others. Good thing she's careful. Negan was here to tell everyone to get out of here. However, Carol wasn't going to leave. She had a plan that would allow them all to stay and live and get rid of the threat of Lance once and for all. Half an hour later, Carol instructed Jerry to take care of the children and brought Negan to a large building. She'd observed Sebastian enter the building and never come out. For her plan's first step, Carol aimed to find Sebastian, for which she obtained the building's blueprints. After meticulous comparison, they discovered an unusual place a hidden room. Negan swiftly moved obstacles aside. As anticipated, there was a concealed mechanism, and Carol, prying off the outer boards, revealed a hidden door. They pushed the door open and the room was small with bottles of wine on the cupboards and floor and even the smell of urine. Sebastian was lying on the bed. This guy knew there was a crusade going on outside so he hid in here. Carol kicked the pillow, and Sebastian groggily awoke. Confused, Sebastian looked at them, not understanding how they had entered. As he reached for a nearby pistol, Megan promptly pinned him down with his foot. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Carol said, there are people out there waiting to punish you, I'm taking you to your mother, I'm the only one who can save you now, you have to trust me. I'm a well-deserved kid, I'm just a problem. <laughs> Outside, 
Pamela was greeted by a chorus of voices calling for the Milton family to step down as she walked out of the administration building. Pamela didn't even dare to stay and got into the armored car under the protection of the soldiers. She then saw that it was written on the walls that the Milton family was out of power and her anger surged. Using the radio, Pamela adjusted the frequency and spoke through the intercom. B-14. Do it well. Just an hour after her call there was an influx of zombies outside the Commonwealth. Pamela's cunning plan involved using an external crisis to downplay internal conflicts. A swarm has been detected five miles out. Lockdown has been instituted by order of Governor Pamela Milton. Return to your homes immediately. After curfew. Upon hearing this, the previously assertive crowd dispersed. Having lived within the walls for over a decade, they lacked the capability to deal with zombies. The soldiers now had a legitimate reason to expel them. Pamela knew this was a temporary solution. Once the zombie crisis passed, the people would likely resume their unrest. Moreover, her son would forever carry the burden of these accusations. At this time the door to the room opened and Sebastian came in in a state of disarray. The one thing he was most afraid of was facing his mother. Sebastian was expecting to be chastised by his mom. But he didn't expect. Yumiko was even more surprised. She doesn't understand what Carol is doing. After hugging he for a while Pamela let go of her hand and slapped Sebastian straight across the face. This wayward son had brought shame to the family. Engaging in such acts and being caught red-handed. What did you have to do with all of this? Say, hey, mom, they want someone to blame and, I, and I'm an easy target. That story is a lie. Pamela knows in her heart what her son is like. I think we can help each other. And who are you? Carol stepped forward, stating, I work for Lance, but he's been hunting my friends in your name. I need you to stop him. Perplexed, Pamela questioned, I know nothing about this, and I fail to see how it benefits me. Carol went on to say, if your son didn't commit such a heinous crime, then it was done by other executives. Carol had already given Pamela a hint as to what she should do. It was a perfect plan, making Lance the scapegoat. The public wouldn't believe it if they found someone else to take the blame. But Lance is different, he's very high up in the Commonwealth. So no one would suspect a thing. Drop your weapon! Guns on the ground!